Hello everyone and good afternoon or good morning or whatever time of the day it is. Today I'm going to talk about Life Cycle Assessment or LCA. We can also call LCA for Life Cycle Analysis and in Swedish it is called Livsikkel Analyse. There is a sort of point to calling it both assessment and analysis because we can say there are various kinds of analysis which is included in the total assessment. It doesn't really matter, we can use LCA as an abbreviation of both terms which essentially mean the same thing. There are a number of metaphors which are used in echo design and life cycle assessment or life cycle analysis. And one of these has to do with the idea that products, be they goods or services, have a life. A product is born or created a product has a sort of middle kind of life, and then the product has its end. We can see this in objects, in plants, animals, in nature. There's the beginning, there's the middle, port turn of ter port of, there's the middle part of life, and then there's the end of life. When it comes to working with the environmental impacts or environmental problems that arise from uh, products, and by products I mean both goods and services, then everyone is in agreement that we have to have a life cycle perspective. We have to consider the product's impacts on the environment from various stages in its life, from what is sometimes referred to as the cradle, the beginning of its life, to the medium time, the middle, middle age of its life, and all the way to the end, the retirement of the product, the death uh, or the decline, at least, of the product. The product might be recycled, something else, uh, but that is from the cradle to most of its life and to the grave. Another metaphor that is used in LCA has to do with uh, the flow of materials from one part of the life cycle to another. We can consider a product as being a momentary connection or collection of a large number of materials or services, products, goods, services, uh, which just happen to be in our hands or in, our, in the location we have it right now. And in life cycle assessment and in echo design and so forth, we speak about supplies as being upstream from the product. And then later in uh, life after the product has been made, if it's a good, after it's been consumed, we speak about being downstream from the middle of the life of the product. And that's a terminology which you have to get used to, upstream and downstream. Whether this is a good or a bad metaphor, upstream or downstream, that's uh, up for you to decide. Uh, but that's what is being used in echo design and in LCA. So I suggest we just have to accept this metaphor of the life of a product and upstream and downstream to sort of be socialized into the world of echo design and LCA. Now an additional metaphor which is used in LCA uh, should be related to, as I said before, a life cycle. And so in life cycle analysis, life cycle assessment, echo design, we can speak of cradle to cradle. But like a term like circular economy, which is very much in vogue, the term is in vogue, but the thinking behind it has been around for a long time. It's just that it has been recently repackaged into something called circular economy. That happened about five years ago. People started talking about circular economy. It became in vogue. It's 2021 right now, and I'm sure that in 2025, there will be still people talking about circular economy. But about by that time, there'll be a new term which will come in vogue, and circular economy will be pushed to the side again. And it will just be up to 
teachers and universities to be able to tell students about the historical development of all these terms. So, circular economy, sure, but it's just one in a number of terms that have been used for decades to talk about the environment and how we need to make sure that materials that we have received, we have taken from nature, keep going in a cycle and that we use them over and over again. In Sweden, in the 1990s, the term was Kretslop or Kretslops economy, circular economy, nothing new. However, with a circular economy perspective, it's not enough to have a cradle to cradle perspective, uh, it's not enough to have a cradle to grave perspective. We have to have a cradle to cradle perspective that the end of life of certain kinds of products is actually the beginning of a new life in a new kind of product or at least of a similar kind of product to one that we are the a similar kind of product to the, to the original product. Finally, an additional term to learn is end of life. And by end of life, I don't mean this end of life. I mean this end of life. End dash of dash life or hyphens between them. This is not the same as end of life. That is the stage in a product's life. End of life refers to a product, a good, not a service, uh, which has reached the end of its life, but has it, and the product has no longer value to the present owner of the product. The consumer finds there is no value left to it, or the value is extremely small. When this item, and a typical example would be, say, a car, which has lasted 10, 15, 25 years, and the consumer doesn't want any more and doesn't want to sell it to anyone else, it may, in fact, have extremely little value in terms of it being a car, then it is sold to a place that will scrap it. And when it is sold to this place that will scrap it, it becomes, in EU terminology, an end-of-life car. Why? It's because now it has become, as waste, a new kind of product. It can be bought and sold on the scrap market before it is finally scrapped. And then it has the possibility of becoming materials in a new product later in life. The new life of a new product. So it's important to understand the difference between end of life and end of life. Those hyphens or those dashes make a lot of difference. And in the EU, with the interest in harmonizing relations on the market between different countries, it was important to come up with a term to describe materials that have not been scrapped or recycled yet, but no longer have use on a consumer market, but have a use on some and have value in some kind of other market. Just like when it comes to environmental management systems, where we talk about environmental aspects, we talk about environmental impacts, environmental effects, and environmental consequences, we need to have terms which describe certain parts of the life cycle of a product. And in this case, thanks to the EU, we have end of life as something that we can describe when the product no longer has a use for a consumer, but before it is being taken apart or whatever is being done at its actual physical end of life. So that was some terminology for LCA. And you need to become familiar with that terminology, all of the terminology which I've mentioned so far, to be able to go further and understand more about LCA. So if you have anything that you need to go back and listen to again, please do so now, pause, and then come back here. LCA consists of a number of steps. In this lecture, I'm going to be talking about four, four steps. Um, and this will be the remainder of the lecture of these four steps. Now, if you are in a course where there's going to be a lot more LCA, this will be just the introductory lecture. However, if you're in a course where LCA is a very small part of it, maybe this is the only lecture you'll be having. In any case, I wish you luck in your studies, or wish you success in your studies. So what's the first step? Generally speaking, when we talk about a life cycle assessment, we talk about the first step 
is consisting of a goal and a scope. Now, just like when you're going to write a student, student paper, you need to have a purpose. You need to work on the purpose to be able to, to make sure that you have, get a good paper out of it. It's the same thing with an LCA. We need to have a goal and we need to have the scope, and they're related. The first question you have to ask yourself is that, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to study an existing product? Are we going to compare two or more existing products? Or are we going to use an LCA based on one or more existing products to try to lay the groundwork for developing a new product, one with a much lower environmental impact to begin with? Another question you have to ask yourself, and you may be working in a team on an LCA, is what relationship do we have with regard to our resources? And our resources are of these following types. Time, our knowledge and skills, money. There could be other resources we could include. If you have a lot of time, if there are a lot of people involved, and you have a lot of money, then you can have a very big study with a very wide scope and very big goals. If you have little time, little experience, little money, then your ambitions are going to have to be quite small. It'll have to be just good enough. Now, my experience is that there are students in the university who are working on an LCA and they have X a number of days or weeks to work on it, and they always say, close to the end of it or in their report, if I only had one more week, if we only had a few more days, we would be able to do so much more. And that's true. But in the real life, you only have two weeks, you only have one month, you only have X amount of time, and you might be working on the LCA, and you might be doing something else in parallel and they're competing for time. So you have to learn to understand that sometimes you're stuck on lowering your level of ambition, but you're still getting something done. Finally, another kind of question that has to do with, with this is that, has there been a similar kind of study that has been done before? Another question, I said finally, another question that, that one needs to think about is, who's going to read this? That might also impact on the goal and the scope, what is going to be done in your LCA study. Another question you need to ask is, what is the functional unit going to be? This is very important. And if you don't, haven't figured out what the functional unit is, and you start working on the study, and you discover at some point that you've made a mistake with your functional unit, then you have to sort of backtrack and do parts of the study all over again. So it's better to spend at least an additional hour or more to think about the functional unit than to just sort of go right off and figure, well, it'll sort of fix itself later on. No, it's better to spend that time in the beginning as opposed to spending hours or days, or if it was a professional study with more time, maybe weeks of time having to redo things. Much better to take that time. You don't want to spend extra time and you don't want to produce something which is a little bit less than was expected. So you're going to try to get that goal and scope approximately the right amount. And the scope has to do also with the size of the system that you're going to study. So if you have little time, you didn't get all that much money, then hopefully your goal isn't too lofty and you have a much smaller sort of scope. So this means we need to understand when something is good enough. We reach a point in time when we understand that I can't do any more, this is good enough. If they wanted me to do a lot more, they would have given me more time and me more resources. I didn't get it. This is good enough. I'm not going to solve all the world problems with this study. I'm just doing one very small sort of cogwheel in a gigantic machine, and that's my part. So, you don't have more time. You don't have more resources. Get used to good enough. And the functional unit is very important. 
If you make a mistake with the functional unit in the beginning, then that mistake is going to cost you. It's going to cost you a lot of time and redoing certain things, perhaps even redesigning the entire study. Therefore, it's important to take some time to figure out what the functional unit is in your study. So it may sound like a surprise that we're actually not interested in the product per se in our LCA study. We are interested in the function which is provided by the product. And the product is a good or the product is a service. And we need to determine a functional unit. Why do we need to do this? One of the most important reasons for doing this is to be able to make my study comparable with another study. We may be looking at different products, but we may have the same functional unit, which makes it easier to compare the studies. So that's comparing between studies. Another reason is that in our own study, if we are comparing two or more products, these products may provide a similar function, but the products may look very different. And so to try to have a neutral basis for comparison between the various products, we need to use the functional unit. And also, by forcing ourselves to think about the functional unit, this means that we, whoever is in the team studying me or you or you just doing it individually, this means it forces you to think more about the product before just running off and doing the study and typing in numbers someplace. And hopefully you will not make a mistake when choosing the functional unit, as I mentioned before. So let's think about this. If we were going to make a functional uh, unit and we were going to study something having to do with food, just as an example. Are we going to compare for the, the sake of, of what is good for us to eat in terms of protein, an egg, a fish, and some beans? They all contain protein. Perhaps what we need to do is we need to study what 100 grams of protein that a human can eat. That's the functional unit. 100 grams of protein, either at one meal or spread out over the day or whatever. Maybe that's something we need to think about the functional unit. So that will be 100 grams of egg protein, 100 grams of, of uh, fish protein, and 100 grams of bean protein. But these kinds of foods don't just consist of protein, they have other things. So it would be 100 grams of protein plus whatever would be, say, in a salmon that provides you with 100 grams of protein, and the same thing with the eggs and the beans and so forth. So you see that this forces to think and to understand more about whatever it is we're comparing or studying. And even if you're not comparing products, you still need to think carefully about the functional unit. Later on in your study, all of the data which you collect has to be related to the functional unit. So you need to divide or subtract or multiply or whatever it is, the, the data that you get and make it in relationship to the functional unit. In this case, I said 100 grams of protein. You could have, at a kilo, you could have had 10 grams, whatever it would be. And we could think of non-food situations, of course. Therefore, the functional unit is extremely important in your study. Next, we decide what is going to be the scope of our study. We have to decide what the boundaries are going to be, and we also have to decide how we're going to construct a model within the boundaries which describes the various parts of the life cycle and the flows between the different parts. Each different part has flows into and out of it, energy used, emissions out, and then a further continuation as the product is put together, either as a goods or a service. When we're working on our model, 
This is sometimes referred to as a system model. Sometimes it's also referred to as a system tree. With the idea that we have trunks and branches and roots and that we have movement of materials along a particular direction. It looks a bit like a tree with branches at the top, many things coming together, and then the service is performed or the good is produced. And then we have this period of time, depending upon what kind of product, if it's a good, we have the use phase, which is sort of like the trunk in the tree. And then if we think about the roots as being waste management, then it could be incineration, recycling, etc. And it could be different kinds of paths that are taken for this. So we have at some point a skeleton which consists of the various parts of our model. It could look something perhaps like this. And now we need to reach the point where we start adding muscles and tissues and other things to the skeleton and we start to really appreciate and understand the entire product and its entire life. We need to begin putting information in the boxes or perhaps instead of putting them directly in the boxes we have tables of information and each table is what would otherwise be put in the box or tables or other kinds of information to show the flows between the boxes. So what we are now doing is we are in entering the inventory stage of our work on our life cycle analysis or life cycle assessment. Sometimes this is called inventory analysis because it's not just a question of an inventory, of collecting material and putting it in inventory. It is actually also a stage of analysis. What do we mean by that? We mean, or what is meant by that, is that yes, you have this data that you've collected it, but how good is the data? What is the information that is behind it? What are the sources behind it? What do I do if I have conflicting sources of data that don't say the same thing? What am I supposed to do with that? How reliable do I think some of this information is? That is a form of analysis. That is also, it's a form of assessing the data, but it's usually called analysis. There's also the issue of allocation. If we have a factory someplace which is, produces 10 different items, it produces thousands of these kinds of items every day, but in our product we only use one of those items, how much of the electricity use in that factory, how much of the carbon dioxide emissions in that factory is going to be included in my product? We have to make a decision. This is also part of the inventory. It's not just a matter of collecting data. It has to be put in a context. So at some point we reach the end of the inventory stage. We have our skeleton. We have the boxes and flows. We have all this information. We have attempted to make some sort of analysis or assessment of the information as to its validity or, or how credible it is. And, and based on some of this, we may actually have made some slight adjustments to the boundaries of our system. We have discovered we needed to include something or we have, for some reason, discovered that maybe we didn't need to include something on the side. That kind of adjustment, that kind of adjustment may have taken place. When the diagram is finished and when the tables are completed, we have what is referred to as an LCI, a life cycle inventory. Now, if you're going to do a complete LCA, we can say you're just getting started doing the LCA. You've only done the LCI. However, for some reason, and it could be very valid, there could be a, an interest in only doing an LCI study. And something like an LCA st LCI study is sometimes done in other kinds of tools that are not LCA but go under the topic or heading of eco-design. So an LCI, even though it doesn't reach this sort of final LCA conclusion, can be an important document and piece of work in and of itself. You may discover some interesting things about your product while working on the LCI. The, the process of doing a life cycle assessment is not linear. I'm presenting this as a linear kind of one stage, one step, and one after the other. 
But as I suggested or alluded to before, it could be that some, at some point during the inventory stage, we discover something about the product we didn't know before, and this means that our system boundaries change a bit. And this is okay. It's sort of like writing a student paper, and you have a purpose, and you work a lot on it, and then you realize that you can't quite do exactly that purpose. So you might change the purpose slightly to better modify what you've actually done, and then you've complete based on that kind of a purpose. You're not cheating, and you've still learned a lot by doing that process also. So it's extremely seldom that if we think about a life cycle assessment as going through a series of rooms and closing doors behind us, we will probably not close the goal and scope door behind us. We might need to return to that at some point and then go forward again. So the doors need to be remained open, even though often when we have completed one step, we might not go back or we might only make a, a quick visit before continuing forward. So now the question is, what's next after the LCI is done? So what is next? What further steps will we take when the life cycle inventory is complete and we will be going on to do a complete life cycle assessment? We take the inventory materials that we have and we translate these or we load them on to select number of environmental problems. Or instead of environmental problems, we could perhaps refer to them as environmental effects or environmental consequences if we use um, environmental management system terminology. What we see here first is classification, then comes characterization, and then possibly afterwards what is referred to as valuation. Not all LCA reports and processes go through all steps. What do these terms mean? Uh, just um, do, so what do these terms mean? If we look at classification, this is a qualitative sorting of everything, of resource use, emissions, etc into a number of predetermined effects or consequences, such as climate change, global heating, eutrophication, biological diversity, and so forth. How is a given resource use, a given emission, a given toxic substance, etc., related to acidification or whatever other effect or consequence, such as biological diversity? For this, you would need to have sufficient knowledge of the environment. Consider also that a given emission might need to be sorted into more than one effect or more than one consequence. The next step is characterization. Here, this is a quantitative calculation about how much of each emission or each resource use contributes to a given environmental effect or environmental consequence. So in classification, we do a qualitative sorting based on our environmental knowledge. And then characterization, we take this and more specifically allocate exact amounts of resource use, emissions, toxic substances, whatever, to specific environmental effects or consequences. When you have completed the classification and characterization, you should be able to see which parts of the life cycle have the greatest contribution to the various effects. Uh, usually it's a rather complicated picture. It might be difficult to see this all in one, uh, in one picture on a screen. Um, so often a user of LCA software looks either at an effect category one at a time and where different parts of the life cycle um, can, be, can be seen or looks at a particular stage and to see which effects dominate at the particular step. You can, of course, try to look at everything at the same time. That's possible. Finally, when it comes to um, valuation and you have to decide whether you're going to do this uh, or not, or whether uh, the specification for your report calls for this, you attempt to weigh all the environmental effects together 
and place value on one effect versus another. This means that um, everything may be boiled down into one particular index. So we weigh everything together and we come up with one number, or perhaps we don't weigh everything together and instead, with no valuation, we let the data, so to speak, speak for itself. Now, in this diagram here, this is a based on a presentation that somebody from Volvo Car Corporation made um, about 20 years ago. And um, there was a comparison in a presentation I saw where a Volvo V70 at the time and a Volvo S50 at the time, they calculated everything down to a unit, which were called an environmental load unit. And the different car models had different environmental load units. The larger the number, the worse for the environment. The other option without valuation is to have the different effects or consequence categories, global warming potential, ozone depletion in the stratosphere, acidification, biological diversity, and so forth. And then you have the two different products. And we have uh, in this diagram, we can see that some have greater, one has greater environment, uh, impact on global warming potential than the other. Um, about the same for stratospheric ozone depletion. One has more impact on a certification than the other. So you choose whether you're going to do, make an index or whether you're going to let the data speak for itself, like in this diagram that we are seeing here. Finally, we come to the interpretation of results. And sometimes this is included in LCA study, and sometimes it's not. The first bullet point here shows that it might not be. What you want to do is you want to be able to tell the reader what you think all of this means. You have to think in terms of making a presentation in your report of the results for the person who might not be reading the entire report. You might want to try to be pointing out where in the product chain that we need to prioritize to reduce the total environmental in, uh, effect. Um, we also might want to tell or suggest how that effect might be reduced, not only where, but how. Now, sometimes the how to make the change is not included because the person who does the LCA says, I'm just producing the LCA study. Now somebody else, a designer, has to take that from there and decide what's going to be the next step or next steps. Something to remember is that an LCA study is merely a snapshot. It is a report about exactly the environmental effects, where they occur in the life cycle and what they are, and a prioritization, perhaps what is the most important to deal with or not, at a given point in time. When too much time has transpired between the study and then somebody reading the study and perhaps wanting to use it, then the results of the study may be too old to be able to base decisions on the results and recommendations. Another consideration is that, uh, I mean, the world is a global market um, and a company during the space of a year or two might make significant changes in their suppliers. And with changes in supplies, sourcing from different places in the world, this means that the information that was included in the LCA may no longer be valid, and the results can't be used to make decisions anymore. Again, this means that the LCA is a snapshot. It isn't really showing any sort of dynamic changes. There's also a logic in what we could refer to as the product system, what developments are driving uh, products, and in the orange box we see below there, we can see that is what an LCA normally includes, but the product system is much larger and things occurring outside the, uh, the, the LCA study might be is just as important to understand what's going to be happening in the future. So all LCA studies have some sort of best before date and they're always a snapshot of reality at that time. Now this presentation is based on, in part on the ISO 1440 and 1440 standards. But you should consider that this entire lecture, these 35 minutes or so, has been a massive simplification of the standard and also a simplification of standard LCA practice.
Also, if you're using LCA software, say Simma Pro, Gobi, or one of the one of the ones that isn't as um, dominant in the market as those first two, um, you have to consider that some of the terms which I have used here in this lecture, you won't see these terms necessarily in the software itself. You will see other terms used. You might also see that certain stages seem to have been lumped together. For example, the classification and characterization stage, at least in Gobi software, for example, when you're working with it, it sort of seems like they've collapsed those two down into one step together. So while the stages in doing an LCA, like I've mentioned here before, and they conform with the ISO standards of so the way to describe it in the terminology, the LCA software application you use may not use those terms exactly in a way that you're used to or what you have heard in this lecture. Something which I have not brought up so much uh, in this lecture is um, databases. And LCA software has one or more databases associated with it in the less expensive try it out kind of software version. And then for the professional version, you can add on additional databases. And the databases can simplify matters for you because then you don't have to track down and be a sort of environmental detective to find information. It already exists in a number of databases, the information you want, might want to have. Also, in some cases, when you're constructing your model with your system tree or whatever it looks like, when it comes to some of the software, there can be ready-made uh, industrial processes that you look up, you find, you click, and you move and you drop on the desktop um, to connect it up to other parts of the life cycle. Um, that is a fantastic simplification, uh, which didn't exist one, once upon a time, but I think it's very important for everyone to understand the background and what's happening within the software before you start using it. If you're going to be using LCA software, you probably should look at the tutorials also and not just have this lecture. As I said before, this is a pre-recorded lecture and depending upon what course you're hearing this lecture in or watching it, this may be the only lecture about LCA or it perhaps could be the first lecture. In the case of it being the only lecture, I wish you good luck with your course. In the case of, of this not being the only lecture about LCA in a particular course, then I'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much and have a good day.